In this tutorial, we're going to go over how we can create save systems for our projects in GDevelop. And this is the second part of this tutorial series. In the first part, we created the logic for setting up this mini farm game example using real world time to give the crops a growth cycle. But we never set up save events. So in this project, um, we're going to go right back through and we're going to add a few lines of code to allow us to create a save system. So that way when our players exit our game and they come back later, they're going to see the game exactly the way they left it. And you don't have to watch the first part to follow along with this um, because it's still a good example of how to set up a save system in your own projects, even if you are interested in the first series which just talks about using time okay so let's close out of this and I'm gonna open our tutorial farm project which is exactly the way we left it at the last video so because it's exactly the way we left it I do want to go through and show what events I'm about to change um, so I will leave a timestamp in the description for the people that just want to learn about the save events, they can skip ahead and watch that. But if you watched the first video and actually built this project along with me, um, you'll remember that I did say that I wanted to go through it and make sure there were no errors before I uploaded it to my itch.io page so that I could be sure it would be a pretty good example for people to download. And I did find a couple errors and I'm just going to go through you through them with um, through them with you while I change them so that if you go to itch.io and download it you don't look at your project and wonder why there are minor differences than what I showed us doing in the video so the first minor difference you're gonna find is here because I found an error in the way I called my variable so right here I'm getting the number from a scene variable and I want to put that number into my text box here and to make sure it's the correct number I'm gonna look at the text box instant variables down here their name their crop name berry or wheat and I'm gonna compare that to my scene variable and if it's the same name I'm gonna get the number and put it here so what did I tell you about number variables in GDevelop we call them a variable if it's a number we say it's a variable and then if it's um, a number that we're about to put into a text string like this text box we would say a two string variable so that's a number okay so I'm calling for a number that's fine I am calling for a number and then I want the number from this number and that's fine but here this is not fine because my crop name variable um, my crop name here berry or wheat that's not a number that's a text so I need to use the correct um, variable that we use for text variables and in GDevelop they call that a variable string okay so now that we have that error fixed <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to look at was this and this is just pretty sloppy on my part because one of the things I love about GDevelop is the ability to create a variable and if it doesn't exist uh, you create it you can create one just by comparing it to something you can say if this variable equals that and GDevelop is going to compare it and if it doesn't exist it's going to create it right then and it's going to assign a default value to it so this this was really sloppy for me not to think about that because I'm asking it to look in the land and check the variable um, in land called stats time. So that's the variable stats, the child time of that variable. And compare that to the timestamp. And if it's less than the timestamp, meaning the, the crop is grown, then to do these things. Um, so as you can see, if you remember, our land doesn't actually have that timestamp variable. I mean that time variable we don't give it that until we pass one of these objects over the land and we pass this whole variable stats into our land and then we add another child to it called time and another child to it called cycle so right now at an empty state of land 
Um, it has no variables whatsoever in it. And we are asking it to look at land. We're not saying if it's not empty, we're not. We're just saying look at land stats time variable and see if it's this. And if it is, do all these things, okay? So what that's going to do is it's going to look in there and it's going to create a variable called stats and it's going to give that variable a child called time and it's going to set the default value to zero. And then it's going to do the same with these because say, oh, well, this is true because zero is less than the current time now. So then it's going to say, okay, what is the number of animation land equal to land variable stats stage seedling? And it's going to look for this stat stage seedling, and it's not going to find it. So it's going to assign it a value of zero. And it's going to say, because uh, my land does happen to be on animation zero, it's going to say, yeah, yeah, that is true. A stat stage seedling, which we just made, is zero, and land is zero. So let's do this action right here. And then because this is true, we're going to come over here, and we're going to do the same thing. This is going to make a harvest variable now and it's going to set that to zero and my animation is zero so this is the same so it's going to set it to wilted now as we have our logic it doesn't really affect our game right now because we're not ever looking to see if it's wilted like right here we want it to be wilted but we also do this so i mean it blocks that out but say we had um, an instance where later on we decide, hey, maybe every time our cycle equals wilted, let's play a wilted crop sound. Well, then every time the player opens a game and there's an empty piece of field or harvests a crop and there's an empty piece of field, it's going to set it to wilted because it's on the default zero. So it's going to check for all these things and just make them because they're not there. And that could interfere with the later logic. So that's one of the reasons why we have to fix it. Another reason we have to fix it is because it's just sloppy. And the third reason we have to fix it is let's look at our land right now. Let's go look at our empty land. So this is our empty land with nothing growing on it. So logically, we have no reason to keep track of its state right now. We have no, um, we don't need to tell it what crop to grow or how long to grow it. So there really should be nothing in there. So let's run the debugger real quick. And let's check out our piece of land. And whoa, we have that whole array in our land. And it shouldn't be in there right now. And all these variables are set to zero. So they're giving our game no relevant or um, necessary information at all. We're just wasting system resources to keep track of a bunch of zeros that we don't need there yet. And I do like to think about things like that. System resources might not be a big deal on good systems, but on slower systems or smaller systems, they can be a big deal. So there's really no need to create a bunch of empty variables that we don't need to keep track of and that don't give our, um, give our game any kind of necessary information. So this is not, nothing game breaking. It's just a pretty sloppy error on my part. So what we're going to do, we are going to, we could fix this by saying if stats time is um, less than timestamp, but not equal to zero, then, then it wouldn't do these if it was zero, but it would still be creating um, a child in stats called time and setting that to zero, which we don't even need that. So instead, what we're going to do is one of GDevelop's powerful, um, I think it's powerful way to check the existence of a variable without adding that variable. And it only works on child variables. So what we're going to do, we're going to highlight that and hit Shift A to get our event box up here. I'm going to drag it up and just bring this under to make it a sub event. And we're going to come in here and we're going to search for child. And we're going to look for the child existence of an object variable. So the object we want to look in is land. And we want to um, say the variable will be stats. Now doing this does create the variable stats, which doesn't previously exist in land. But we were doing that anyway, the first way I did it. But now at least we won't be creating every other variable because we're just going to nip this in the bud right here 
and we're going to um, say the land will be the object, the variable will be called stats, and the child will be time. And we need to put time in double quotes. Okay, so now that we have that set up, we'll run this and just glance at the debugger real quick. And we're going to see a huge difference. So going through that land with the huge array of empty values that we didn't need to keep track of, we have really toned it down. Just by, just by specifying that the child time has to exist in the first place. It's not going to do anything under, which was what was causing all those other variables to add, okay? And like I said, this is probably the only, I believe this is the only way you can check a variable in gdevelop to see if it exists without actually creating it. I could be wrong. There may be one or two other ways, but they're not common, and they're pretty powerful um, tool to have in your arsenal. So that way you can check if something exists, a child exists, without actually creating that child. So you will notice in the debugger, we still have a child of stats called cycle, which is a lot better, but we also don't need that. And that comes from these two events below, where I'm calling, um, I'm asking gdevelop to look into stats and um, find the child cycle and see if that equals that. And what did we just say when we're asking gdevelop to look into something and see what the value is, it's going to create that if it doesn't exist, and it's going to assign it the default value. So we're just going to do a similar thing here. We're first going to check if cycle even exists in land before we check its value. So let's just highlight that and hit Shift A to get our little event box. We'll drag it up and we'll drag all three of these conditions under that, and we'll make it a subcondition of that. Okay, and so we'll just come up here and we'll copy this and we'll paste it here and we'll change the name of the child to cycle and we still need that in double quotes so we're going to do the same thing down here where i also have it asking now this time i do have a condition <clears throat> but this time the condition is um if the blade is in the land so the blade can be in the land if nothing's in it and if there is no such thing as cycle because I could have some harvestable crops over here and I could come to drag the blade over there to harvest them and that just passed the blade through these empty pieces of land. So it would create a cycle child in those land that isn't groundbreaking, but it doesn't need to be there. So we're just gonna do the same thing. We'll highlight that and hit Shift A and we're just gonna drag it up and make these two conditions a sub event to the condition that we even have a child called cycle to begin with. So we'll copy this here and we're going to paste it right there. So now if um, if our blade is dragging across the land, it's first going to check if the land even has a cycle. Because if it doesn't have a cycle, that means it's empty and it doesn't need to do these next checks. Okay. So now that we got that um, that cleaned up, we are going to go, the next little piece of logic I cleaned up is also in this little event block. And that is this repeat for each instance. And so I have tested and tested, and I just can't replicate um, this situation. If you remember, the reason I added that is because I had made two projects in the last tutorial. I'd made the project, my concepts project, that I showed in the opening of the tutorial, and then um, together we just went and built that from scratch and I never referred to the the concept one that I had made I was just like going off memory and you know how I had done it um so I must have done something different because I remember in the concept project I made I had to put a repeat for each there because if I didn't there were times when I could harvest the land and say instead of eight crops I would only get back um, six so I ended up having to put a repeat for each event there. And I just can't replicate it in the way we actually ended up doing the project on the video. So I am taking this one out because if you don't need a repeat event, then it's better not to use one because they can be resource, resource intensive. So I think for this project, 
Um, since I can't replicate the behavior of it not giving me the right amount of crops when I harvest, I really think the blade point X being inside the land is enough for GDevelop to be picking which land it is and giving me the right, the right amount of crops back. That being said, if it's different in the project that you followed along and made and yours is, sometimes incorrectly giving you the value of crops or like it's only it's only counting that you harvested six pieces of land then go ahead and put that repeat for each back up in there okay so the next cleanup i did was right here first of all let's change this scale to be right under that because it just fits better that's uh that's the object we're scaling so we'll just put it there but i noticed i had two events that were exactly the same as these two events. And that in itself is not a problem, but we can just clean it up and make it a little nicer. So basically I'm saying, if the land is harvested and it's wilted, I want it to do these two things, regardless of if it's harvest or wilted. So the only other stage of land we have is seedling, and that's the only stage of land I don't want it to do these two things for, because these two things will reset the land. And we don't want it to reset the land when it's a seedling because, of course, then it never finishes growing and the player will get mad. So let's change this um, equal sign and we'll change that to not equal. And then we'll change wilted. We're going to change that to say seedling in double quotes. Okay, so now we can delete these right here because... Um, it's going to check if there's a child called cycle. And if it is, it's going to look and see if it's on harvest. If it's on harvest, it's going to create the crops and scale them. And it's going to come down here. And it's going to set the, the variable and the land both to zero to reset them. It's not going to do anything for wilted. We could add something under this harvest, like right there. So it's a separate condition. If it's on harvest, create crops. If it's on wilted, create dead grass. And then if it's not seedling, do these. So basically anytime, anytime you run it over the land animation now, if there is a wilted or a harvest, it's going to reset that land to zero. Okay, so now that we have that cleaned up, the next thing I was going to change was this right here. So as it stands, we do not have the scene, the scene variable where we store our crop, we do not have that update immediately when we harvest the crop. The way I have it set up in this logic. So when I harvest the crop, it doesn't update until the tweens on those little objects we create finishes. And that's, that's all very fine and well. And I did it because I kind of wanted like a which it really doesn't give you too much of a pause anyway, but I wanted kind of a pause effect before it added the crops we were harvesting. So that's why I set it up to do it after that tween had finished. The only problem is, what if you're just harvesting real quick and then closing out the game before those tweens are counted as finished? So now with our save events, you'll come back to the game and those crops will be gone from your fields and they wouldn't have been added to your inventory because you closed it out before the scene variable added them because the tween had not finished. So we're just going to take this whole thing and we're going to move it up here to our harvest event. So now immediately when we harvest, it's going to create the crops and then it's going to change the variable. And we can also change this add picks picked instances count crops because if you remember the reason we had it down here sometimes the tweens would finish playing at once um like one or two tweens and if it did and we had add one it would only count that one so we had to tell it to if if more than one tween finished at the same time to add the entire amount of them that finished at the same time but that's going to be unnecessary here because here we're not linking it to this cropped object that's playing the tween here it still says um it still says that name but we're just using that name to tell what variable gets added to okay so now it's just tied to when we harvest each of our lands it's going to do that we will keep an eye on that if it seems that um the adding one isn't working correctly and we need to go back to the add peaked instances 
count crops, we can. But honestly, I think with the um, the way this is set up, it's just going to see every time the blade is in the land and it does this, it also adds that one. So, okay, so the next thing we're going to clean up is this one where when our tween bounce is finished playing, we delete the crops. Because the only reason I had this here, in the last video I showed you we could just come in here and say yes destroy that object when the tween finishes and leave it like that but we had decided or I had decided to set it up like this instead because I also had wanted to add that action to it but now that we're not adding that action to it we can just come into our um, tween right here and make sure that box is checked to yes destroy that object when it's finished and now we can just delete this because we don't need it anymore. Okay, and this last thing I changed, you can completely not worry about. I am just explaining it because like I said, if you built the project along with me and you would like to go download it from HIO for comparison, I don't want you wondering why certain things were changed. So this thing I want to change right here um, is just because I have an idea to maybe use this as a buffer um, not for the tutorial so much, just completely on my own to figure out how to do it. So I have this idea that since I'm tying the um, scene variable of the crop number, I'm not putting that in the text box. I'm not changing the text box based on that, though I could. I could just cut out this middleman completely and set this to change it to the scene variable of that crop quantity name, okay? But the way I have it set up, it's setting the scene variable to a variable in the inventory and then based on that it was also checking um, it was also changing the inventory to be the inventory's variable name and the inventory's variable number it was changing the text of our text box I mean to be the variable name and number but I kind of have an idea of figuring out how to do a buffer with that since I'm since I'm using that indirect way I could perhaps pass the scene variable to this inventory variable and then set up some kind of repeat event or maybe a timer on this to where it will um, add or subtract the number um, that's stored in its own quantity to make the, the crop quantity um, match up with the, the text it's displaying. So just because of that, I'm changing this and like I said, you don't have to do anything with this. I just wanted to explain why I'm changing it. It'll just kind of help me remember later, like, oh yeah, I'm, I kind of wanted to do that. So I'm going to put, if the inventory, um, I'm going to put compare the text. So I'm going to look at the text of the inventory. And I'm going to see if it's not equal, okay? And the text I'm comparing it to, I want it to be the same thing. Even the same setup right here, okay? Because that's what I want it to set it to. So I'm going to go ahead and double click this and just highlight this and copy it. And now I'm going to come back in here and paste it. Okay, so basically I'm looking at my display text and I'm seeing is my display text equal to three things. My variable name, this weird little symbol uh, colon with a space, and my own variable crop quantity. And if it is not equal to that, so like say I have all this but my crop quantity says seven and my crop quantity in my um on my display says six. Then I'm gonna change the text and set it to that. And it'll just it'll just update it the way we the way it was already updating it. So it really doesn't um change things too much in this project. So now we are all caught up with all the minor changes I made so that when I upload this to itch.io after I post the video, um, if you wanted to check it out, you'll see everything's exactly the same. So now we just have one um, thing to do to set up our save events. And that is to go in here and make our land draggable. So we're going to land behaviors and we're going to add the draggable behavior. Okay, so with that set up, we should now be able to move our land in our scene and that way I can also show you how to um, save positions of things 
when, when you're creating your save system. Because I did that, you can skip this next part. It's optional. I also want to create um, an extension, and I'm going to import an extension. And it's going to be an extension I have on my desktop. And it's called Isometry, and it's by D8H. He does a lot of good examples and extensions. Uh, so this is called Isometry, and it snaps items to a virtual grid. And if you searched in extensions, right now you wouldn't find it. Right now, I believe the only way to get it is to go into the um, GDevelop example project that has that extension in it already, and to export that extension so that you can use it in your projects. And I do have a tutorial on that. It's called something like how to export an extension in GDevelop. And it uses this exact extension um, as an example because this was the extension that actually made me learn how to export extensions because it's much easier to export an extension to import it into your own game than it is to keep opening that GDevelop example project and deleting everything in it just because you want that extension. So now that we have that, we can set up my land that when it's being dragged, it's going to snap to an isometric grid. And you can also do it um, instead of being dragged, you can say if it's being dropped, um, snap it to a virtual isometric grid. But I just am going to do drag for this project. The only difference is if you set it up on dropped, it gives you a much smoother drag. But I feel like if you set it to um, snap to an isometric grid while you're dragging it, it gives the player a better idea of, of the placement that it will look like when they let go. So with this uh, last con condition highlighted, I'm going to hit uh, Shift A. Oh no, I meant Shift W. And I'm just going to get an event group. And we'll call this one... Mm, land placement, I guess, for now. I might change that. Land placement. And we'll drag one of these under there. Uh, just because I like to. You do not need to do that on these things. You know, you only need to do that if you're doing a sub-event. But we're going to search for the condition. And we're going to say land was just dropped. And I'm going to OK that. And then we're going to put um, snap. Snap objects to a virtual isometric grid. And our object will be land. And the, the land itself is actually 100 by 100. But the visible dirt part, not the crop part, but the dirt part is only 100 by 50 height. So we're going to put, um, we're going to half that. We're going to, instead of putting 100 by 50, I'm going to put 50 by 25. And then I'm going to zero, zero offset. And so when we do that, um, the, the only thing it's going to do why I have it is that way um, I did just dropped. Let me fix that because I really like the drag better. The dropped feels so smooth. Okay, so it's just uh, being dragged is what I wanted, not dropped. So the only difference is when we, when we move our land. Oh my god, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that on film. Look, I put them both in there. Okay, so I, I want to move this one out. Delete that one. Okay. The only difference is, instead of making me just make wide, um, like if I set it to 100 by 50, I would only be able to set them like exactly that much apart. Whereas by doing it by half that, I could set them a little closer if I wanted more decorative, you know set up. So we got that set up. The next thing I like to do, and I'm just going to mention it since it's in the tutorial. Um, I also like to come in here and let me hit shift A. And in my beginning scene events, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put snap objects to virtual grid land. I'm going to use the exact uh, numbers that I used in that because otherwise it might look funny. So that and that, 50, 25, 0, 0. And the reason I like to do this, a lot of times the isometric grid you set up in your scene editor to place items does not quite match up with the virtual isometric grid in game. So that say you first went to touch an item, which counts as a drag as soon as you put your mouse down. 
So what would happen is it would actually, even if you dropped it in the same space, it might jut out a little now and not line up exactly because the scene editor one might be a little off from the one that's in the game. So I like to put that in the beginning of scene events so that um, no matter if it matches up or not here, when it runs the beginning of scene, it takes all those items and it quickly snaps them to a virtual isometric grid that's gonna match the one you're using in your game. And oddly, it has not mattered in this. And a lot of my, a lot of my projects, it does matter. So the only thing I could think of is because I used really funky sized um, sprites. You know, I put 100 by 100, which is like such a weird size to use. But I was just in a hurry to get the, uh, the tutorial done because I try to make one every week. So, um, and oddly enough, using that 100 by 100, I have not, I don't even need this up here, but I'm just putting up there to show you that it is good to have there in case you do need it. Okay, so now that we got our land set up, let me see. Um, save systems. We're going to start our save systems now. We're all ready. When you make a save system, there's a few things you have to decide. You have to decide what you want to save. So we're looking at our game and we say, okay, we're going to need our scene variable that has the number that gets stored in these texts. We don't necessarily need the number stored in these texts because these that's just to show... Um, Let's just to change our text so the player can see what those values in our scene variable is because they can't directly see our scene variable. Um, you know, they can't go into the debugger and open it up and look into our scene variable to see how many crops they have. You know, and they could be like, oh, well, right now, okay, the, the debugger says I don't have any berries or wheat. So... <laughs> we need to save that scene variable that we just looked at the parent name is stats it's the same name as the variable we gave to our land okay um and the child of that was called crops and then the, the crops will have as many children as we give it you know in game as many different crops as we give it right now it has two children so that's one thing we need to save. we need to save that scene variable that puts these values here Another thing we need to say, we need to save our land. And our land, of course, by default, does not have its own variables because it doesn't know what it's going to be. It doesn't know what the player is going to decide to grow in it. Now, we could actually change that. And we can make a logic that um, this is a strawberry pot. And, this, and it would be like a piece of land, really. It would use the same logic. The only difference is we wouldn't be passing that logic from one object to our strawberry pot. The strawberry pot would be built in to the strawberry pot variable. It would already have how much time and you know all that. But since since the way we're doing it, um, we're letting players plant different things on this piece of land, we don't really have variables in here. What we're doing is we're storing variables in each of these objects and we're passing them to the land and then we're adding two additional variable children to that um, stats variable that the land needs, but this doesn't really need, you know. Because this doesn't need to have the time that it's planted. Only the land needs to have that. This only needs to have the length um, of time that it takes to grow it. It doesn't need to have the exact time the player planted it. So we will need to save that. The variable that we put in here and add two more children to, we need to save that too so that when we start the game, it's going to be able to go through each piece of land and see what needs to be planted where. So in addition to that, we're going to need two more variables stored in our stats variable. And that's going to be the land's position, X and Y. Because now that it's draggable, we'll need to know the position. Um... And actually, even if it wasn't draggable, we would need to know the position of what land has strawberries versus what land has wheat. So regardless of if we make it draggable or not, we are going to need that X and Y. 
and how we set it up is going to be different whether it's a draggable or a static object or it can be different or we could do it the same way it wouldn't matter but the main thing would be to compare the x and y to where the land is and if that value matched then we could put uh, those variables in that land so that it would now be growing the correct thing that's for static um, now for movable there's actually even an easier way to set that up so let's see I believe was that all we needed to save yeah pretty much the the value of our scene variable that that puts values in our text box shows how many crops we have and the X and Y position of the land along with the um, parent variable stats of the land so with that in mind the next thing we need to look at is how to save them where to save them so one thing about save events you could do them manually you could have the player press a button like if the player releases um, oh I'm spelling it wrong no wonder if the player releases the S key then we're going to add these events to save it. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to do a more automatic saving where the player might not necessarily know they're doing events that are saving the game. Um, so, one thing you want to look at is where does it make logical sense to insert a save? I mean, you could just have it save every five seconds or something, but there, there are logical places to save the game. So, one logical place would be every time you move a piece of land. That would be a logical place to save the game, right? But the problem with that is that you might end up checking like several times a second. Every time your code is repeated, you would have this repeat for each piece of land. If the land was just dropped do a save system okay so for several times a second every time it went up and down and read that code it would be like is this piece of land been dropped is this piece of land been dropped is this piece of land been dropped? has this piece of has this piece of has and you know most of the game the land is not going to be dropped so that's a lot of resources to be using over and over and over and over and over when the land is just innocently sitting here like seriously if we set it up like that repeat for each piece of land if the land has just been dropped save the land's position that means us just looking at the game right now it's like is this land is this land is it is it dropped 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 okay so so um even though we could do it like that uh one way we might be better is to create a system that we know when the land has been dropped okay so that way we don't have to ask if it's been dropped because we can tie all land dropping to one action and if that action is executed we can pretty much guess that the land was probably just dropped and that we need to do a save event so of course I'm talking about a menu if you have a menu if you cannot drag the land unless you have the land dragging menu open the level editing menu open then the rest of the game you're never checking to see if the land is moved okay because you don't care you don't care if it's moved or not because the only way it will count is when you go to close that level editing menu and that's where you tie your save event so you're not constantly asking for each piece of land have you just been dropped 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 have you just been you're just saying I don't care if it's been dropped or not they can drop it all day long but I'm not saving a damn thing until we close that level editing menu and then we'll execute our save event so that's one good place to put a save event if you have um, if you have an event that needs to be saved that might require too much like intense for each object action in order to constantly monitor that so that's what we're going to do in this project we're just going to create a very simple condition that we can't drag the land unless that menu is open 
and that we can't play the rest of the game until that menu is closed. So when that menu is open, we can do what we want, and when we close it, we just save the state of the game. Maybe the player didn't make any changes when it was open. We don't care. We just close it, and every time we close it, we save the game. So that's one way to do it. Now, the next thing we can look at, when is another thing change? That was for dealing with changes in the land. Because you can change the land. You can open your game and, and edit everything without doing anything else. So that really doesn't need to be tied to anything else. Same with planting and harvesting. Um, we can't just tie our save events to the editing of the level. Because you could come in the game and plant stuff without ever without ever editing your level. So then it's not saving anything if the only place you're saving your game is when the level edit menu closes. And that's conversely, that's why we have that level edit menu thing. Because you can also come in the game and not plant anything where you have planting save events set up. We're going to save when we plant but you could just edit your level and go to leave and then when you come back it looks just the same as you left it because you didn't plant anything and all the save events are tied to planting so we are going to make a save event around a level editing menu that way if if any of this land is moved as long as that um, menu is closed back up it'll save another good place when we're doing our crops we are changing stuff so it only makes sense to set up a save event tied around dropping that. Because anytime we drop one of these items, it probably means we changed something in the game. See, I pick it up, I harvest some things, and now I need to change and save those events. I pick this up, I plant some things, and now I drop it and those things are changed. I need to save those events. So that's another good area to tie a save event to. Because every time we pick up one of these objects and do something with it, there's a chance that we just change something. So as soon as we're done using it, when we drop it, that's a good, that's a good area to put a save event. Now a third good area to put a save event would be tied around your values changing, your scene variables. <clears throat> However, in this project, we don't need to worry about that because our variables only ever go up. They don't go down. We haven't made any machines yet that can do anything with these crops. So since our values aren't going down and since the only time our values can possibly change is when we harvest something, and since when we harvest something, we have to drop that again. That means we don't need a save event tied to this value because it's going to automatically save that scene variable when we because we're using that scene variable to save everything in our game. Okay, so we don't need to specifically do that. Now it would be a lot different if you could come into the game and do stuff with your crops um, that did not have its own save events then you would need to tie a save event to the quantity and say every time the quantity changed to save the game. You know, if you did it that way. I'm not saying if you didn't have machines, you wouldn't just tie events to save events to your machines. And then you still wouldn't need to worry about tying a save event to that. So with those um, things in mind, we'll, we're now going to set up how, about saving our game. So we are going to tackle the easiest one first, the one we already have in place. And that's going to be the dropping of our icons. We're going to set up a save system there. So we're going to say, um, we're going to find our menu icons placement. And we're going to look for the menu icons was just dropped. And remember, our menu icons were these three objects right here. And we're going to add save events to our menu icons was just dropped. So highlight it and click um, Shift A. And we're just going to bring that under. It's going to be a sub event. And we're going to want, first of all, very first thing, to add the variables we don't have that we're going to need to save. And that was the X and the Y position of the land. And if you remember, we don't actually save those. Um, we don't actually put those in our land during in-game events. And it makes no sense to put them there 
because we're constantly overriding the, um, the variable stats. Because we would want them in stats, because stats is the whole variable that we're saving. But we're constantly overriding stats with the gameplay. We're growing different crops, and that's going to overwrite stats. So we would be constantly, we'd be having to be like, um, if we harvest the crops, do this and change the variable stats x, y to the land position. And if we're planting the crops, do this and change the variable stats x, y to the land position. We'd have to write it like three different times. So it makes sense just never to even worry about it until we get ready to save. So our very first thing we're going to do in our save event and this is going to have to be a repeat for each land. So let's go ahead and hit Shift W and put a for each object. And we're going to put um, land. We're going to drag that up and we're going to pull this one under that. So it's a sub event. And what we're going to do is we're now going to create a variable X and a variable Y for each piece of land. So we'll hit land and then variable, value of an object variable. We want this variable to be a child of our main variable stats because that's the one we're going to save. So we'll put stats.x and we're going to set it to um, our lands x position. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this and we're going to paste it underneath. And we're going to change stats. Um, we're going to give stats a child of Y. So put stats.y. And we're going to change that to our lands Y position. So land Y. <clears throat> so now when we run this, anytime I drop anything, we should be able to go into the debugger and check out our land. And it should all have an X and a Y position even though, you know, you know, we don't normally have one. So sure enough, our land has an X and a Y position in the variable called stats. Okay, so we have that set up. Now bear in mind, we still don't have that set up to where it works when we drop the land. That's going to be tied to our menu um, closing event. But right now we're just setting up our event that we're going to put when we drop the menu icons. So now that we have our variables X and Y in the land, now we can go ahead and save our land variables. And we could set up a counter and save them each individually into storage. And that's actually not a bad way to do it. I've done it in projects, especially when I was just starting and wasn't really comfortable with using structured or arrayed variables. Um, so you could do it that way. The way I'm going to show you, we're just going to use structures and arrays because that way we can just save it all at once. So we need, now that we have stats, and stats has, um, we already have stats, you know, if we had something planted. But even if we don't have something planted, we now have the X and Y position of the land. So now we're going to need to save our whole stats variable. Um, and if you remember on our planting crops, where we take our stats variable out of our crop icons and we put it into the land, we did that by using JSON to turn the land, um, crop icons variable stats into JSON and then to convert that JSON and put it in, make it into a structure stats in our land variable. So we're going to do something similar here. But... We are going to, um, instead of just doing this one by one, we're going to do something called append to an array. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means you have an array. An array is very like a structure, um, except for it can only have numbers, and it makes its own numbers as a name. So it's always going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. Those are its children. So you can't name it yourself. That's just the way arrays are. But what you can do is you can append a variable to an array. And that means you can take an array and whatever values it has in it, you add one more value at the last place. So if it already has 0, 1, 2, 3, and you append um, a value to that array, 
Now you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4 is the one you just put there. So that's what we're going to do. So, and I should point out, that's how the arrays um, are called and function in GDevelop. I'm not specifically talking like that's a an array that you would use in a programming language. I'm just saying we're using GDevelop terminology to describe the things that um, and how they operate in GDevelop. So, <clears throat> to put our our um, our stats variable into an array, we're going to need to change that variable stats that's in our land into a JSON. And then we're going to have to put it into a child variable of our stats scene variable. Okay? So, let's go ahead and do that first. Let's search for append. And we're going to find append a variable to a scene array. And our scene array doesn't exist yet. But the parent of this array is called stats. And that's our scene variable that already has a child named crops that's storing all of our inventory of crops in it. So we're going to give it another child. And this child we're going to call land. And this is going to be our array. And how we know it's an array, we're appending stuff to it. So that's going to make it an array. If we just started putting stuff in it and naming it um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, then that's actually a structure. We have to append stuff to it. So now, now that we know that we're going to make a child in stats that's called land, um, we want to append our JSON to it. And actually, that looks really weird. Okay, and here's what it is. Once again, I'm trying to append a text because a JSON is a text, but I'm over on variable, which is a number. So what we really need to do, we need to find the string. We need to append a string to a scene array. So let's find the string. Here we go. Append a string to a scene array. And once again, our array, we're going to put it in stats, and it's a child. We're going to call it land. So stats.land. And now to get our string, we're going to have to turn our object variable from our land into a JSON. Okay? And how we get that, we just type JSON, and we're going to see object var to JSON. Then we'll need our object, a comma, and our variable. So we'll select object var to JSON. And our object is land, so we'll select land. Now we do a comma, and now we put the name of the variable which we want to turn into a string. And that's called stats. And so let's just click OK. And now it says append string object var to JSON land stats to array variable stats land. OK? So now we have that set up. And. Let's run a preview real quick. I want to make sure everything's working right. So we'll drop an item and then we'll run the debugger. Okay, and now if you look in our scene variable of stats, you see we still have our berry and our wheat that um, we create from using our little text box displays. But now we also have a child of stats called land, and it's an array. And in this array, you see we have every piece of land. And it goes up to 31. We have 32 pieces of land, but arrays always look like they're short one piece because they always start out at zero. So that piece of logic is working. And <clears throat> actually, this is a good time to show you something else. So when you append an array, it doesn't care what, already, what is already in it. It's just going to keep adding stuff. So we've already dropped something once and made it append things to the array. So now let's drop something again. And now let's go check our debugger. And we'll just go ahead and refresh it. And now you can see our land, the child that's in stats, actually has um, 64 
things in it. Because what happens is, every time we drop something, it's going to keep appending those, all those pieces of land. Because we didn't clear it out. So we need first to be able to clear that out in case it's already put land in there. So every time we drop something, we want it to append something, but we don't want it to keep adding the same things over and over. So we need to clear that out. So let's just go ahead and we'll hit Shift A. And right above this event, we're just going to make another event. And there's a lot of ways you can clear out an array. I'm just going to... um. I'm going to hit it with a hammer, and I'm just going to say, we'll add our condition, we'll say variable, and we'll say the, we'll go ahead and say value, make it a number variable, the value of a scene variable, and we'll say stats, oh, land stats dot land is not equal to eight then we're gonna um change the variable to eight So value of an object variable, oh, I mean scene variable, and that was stats.land, and we're going to set it to 8. All right, so let's update that and see if we can drop something a couple times and only have 32 pieces of land in our variable. Okay, so here's our land array that's in stats. And you can see we only have 32 values in it. That's 31 plus the one named zero. So that's working. Um, and like I said, there's other ways to clear out arrays. I just was going for a very direct approach. So just to be clear, every time we drop the menu icons, it's first checking to see if stats land equals eight, which it shouldn't. It's either gonna equal zero or it's gonna equal our array. Um, either way, it's gonna just change the whole thing. It's gonna overwrite the whole thing to eight. And then once it does that, we know it's safe to now turn this variable that says eight, we're gonna turn it into an array by appending these things to it. So the eight just vanishes, it goes away. The 8 overwrites the array, and then right behind it, the array overwrites the 8. So that's what we just did there. Okay, so now that we have that set up, we are changing our variable, and then we're taking all the land, we're turning them into a JSON string, and we're storing them into... Um, actually, let's run the debugger real quick, just so you can see what it... The, I can remind you what the JSON string looks like. Um, when it actually has a lot of stuff into it. So let's refresh this. And so now this is our JSON string. And it's good for storing information. And for me anyway, it's less helpful for editing information. I really need um, my information when I'm editing it in a game. I really need it to be a structure like this. This is where we edit. This right here for our um, scene variable this is just how we store information so that later we can um, turn it into a structure at the beginning of the game, okay? So this is all of our little information stored into one long string. So now that we have that um, information written the way we want it, now we have to make an event to save it to our storage. So let's just click Shift A and now we're just going to write um, this whole thing to our storage. So let's go ahead and find the right action. And we're going to write a text because we're writing that one long string. So it doesn't count as a number. Okay. 
Now we have to make a storage name. And typically your storage name should be something specific to your game, such as um, like com dot your games that only you has that name of dot farm game. You know, something that it's not going to um, accidentally be the same name as another name that the user has, like that's a really common name, like, I don't know, farm game storage. So you're just going to want to write uh, something that's specific to your game. So for this project, let's see. We are just going to call our storage name. we got to put this in double quotes. We're going to call it... Um, well, I mean, you call it your name. I'm going to call it Lucky J Tutorial Farm. Okay? And it will be case sensitive as everything in GDevelop is. So, <clears throat> now that you have a storage name, you have to think of a group. And the group, you can have it anything you want. Let's see, I'm just going to name this stats because every other main variable in my game is called stats. My main scene variable is called stats. My main land variable is called stats. So now the storage group will be called stats. And that's where I will be storing my variable called stats. And so now the text. And you can probably guess what text we're going to be writing. Okay, so let me close this. It's already set up for us. We have already taken the object var to JSON that was our structure in our land and stored it into our structure scene variable called stats, okay? So now, if you can guess that we want to write our scene variable stats as a scene variable to JSON, you are right, because we can't just store it as the structure, because it is a structure, even though it's got those JSON strings in it. Let's go look at our JSON strings. Okay, so even though our scene variable has JSON strings in it, it itself is not a JSON. It's a structure. And it has these in it, and it has these in it. And, you know, before we're done, it might have gold in it too. We don't know. So we can't just store a structure. We have to break it down into a JSON. And then later, we just um, unpack that JSON and make it back into a structure. So... In our storage, uh, your name tutorial farm, in the group stats of that, we are going to write, let's search for JSON. We are going to write to JSON, and that's just our plain scene variable to JSON. Okay? And what's the name of the scene variable we want to turn into a JSON? That's our good old variable stats. Okay, so now we have the actions. We clear out this stats land variable in case it was already an array so we don't keep appending items to it and end, end, ending up with like 8 million different pieces of land in our game. So once we clear that out, we overwrite that with our stats land after we add the X and Y children to stats and we append um, all our different lands Jasons to the stats land variable. And then we take the whole scene stats variable and we, we write it into the group stats of our storage named Lucky J. So we have just we have just saved our events. Um, so now when we're when we're doing this, our events are being oh I just saved everything. Oh I just saved them again. Okay. Oop there they go. I saved again. So every time I drop one of those right now. We're saving that event. It's actually in our storage. The only thing is we're not going to be able to access it until we tell our game to load that from our storage. So typically that's um, that could be done anywhere actually. I've seen projects where people just have a load button in the game. And you can come into the game and you can hit load and then it will load the game. But for this tutorial we're going to set that up in our beginning of scene events. So we need to get um, get that out of our storage. So we wrote it into our storage. 
right here. We wrote that text into our storage. So now we're going to need to read a text to get it out of our storage. So let's go ahead and... Um, now loading is actually where I think most people have problems with save events. Because people forget they already have events in their beginning of scene that is setting up the scene as if the player has never played before. And that's not wrong. But you just need to analyze your events that you already have in your beginning of scene and find a good place to incorporate um, your loading events. So for instance, changing the text to match the text um, right here, that should be done after I load my save events. Doing it before, it might make my text equal zero until I harvest something because it'll start the game as if from a fresh state that no one's ever played. And so the values will be zero and that's what it'll set the text to. And then it'll go on down here where I load my events and get my true values like 800 wheat and 10,000 um, strawberries, but it won't actually update that yet because I didn't tell it to until later on in my events where I do tell it to. Um, so just little things like that. Like, actually, I don't think, uh, yeah, that would matter probably. But just little things like that. Also, snapping land. That should probably be the last, the last action to do. There's no need to snap my land until everything else is done. I mean, you just look at stuff, um, and analyze where would be a good place to load. So let's go ahead and hit Shift A so we can create our, our read event. And before we even do that, let's go ahead and say, before we read, we're gonna check if it exists in storage. Because it can happen that if, if it doesn't exist in storage, um, you might accidentally break your game sometimes. If you try to do stuff and you don't have it saved, um, it actually usually only happens when you're developing a game that you get to a point where all your land vanishes and stuff because you didn't check for the existence first. Um, so we're just going to check for the existence of a group. And I think that's always good to look if that even exists in storage. Because if not, we don't need to do the rest of that. So let's see. And our storage name was called, I know what mine was called, Lucky J Tutorial farm that was my storage name and the group of my storage of course was named after my main variables which was stats so i'm gonna look if that a group exists in storage okay now the very first thing i'm gonna want to do if that group exists in storage is to delete my land all this land here and you don't have to do that you can, instead of deleting it, just in the next events where we're um, repopulating the scene, you can just compare the X and Ys of the land in this scene and be like, oh, well, that's there, so we need to create this there. I find just deleting it and recreating it from the things I pull out of storage is a lot more efficient. Especially, uh, I guess most of the projects I do, the player can actually buy or sell land so they might have two pieces of land or they might have um 20 or they might have 100 i don't know how many they have so it's easy for me to delete the objects that i had already placed for them in the beginning of the scene and let and let my save events load the actual objects they actually have okay so that's the very first thing i'm going to do i'm going to check if that exists in storage, guess what? I don't need any of that land. I mean, it might be all the same land in the same place. I don't know. I don't care. I'm just going to delete it and let the storage um, recreate whatever it has in the place it has it in. So, delete land. So now, if we run our preview, 
And we're going to look for... Oh, wait a minute. Try this again. Okay, there it goes. I was going to say, did I write that wrong? So just by checking... If this existed in storage, and I guess it saw it did. Although, at first, it didn't, so I don't know why. But anyway, just by saying it existed in storage, it's now deleting the land. So, so far, so good. It's working exactly as we want it to. Um, so, the next thing after that we're going to need to do is to get our land back from the land that we have in storage. So we're just going to drag this under here to make a sub of it. And the next thing we need to do is read this um, stats that exist in storage. So let's go ahead and hit read and we're going to use read a text. And our storage name was, Lucky, well, I mean, yours wasn't, but mine was this, Lucky J Tutorial Farm. And my group was called Stats. Okay, so we're going to read a text, and we're going to store it in a scene variable. So we're going to store this in our scene variable, Stats. Okay, so now we're going to run the debugger. And we're just going to look at what we have here. Let's check our scene variable called stats. And we see we have a berry um, and a wheat. So where is our uh, save event? Where's the JSON or the um, string that we just took out of storage? Well... <coughs> Remember where I said you have to make sure that the events make sense? So we have to pull this down below that, like I would said. Okay? And now... We need to convert our string because what it's doing right now, when we put our string in there and it's later needing to write something to stats, what is it doing? It's overwriting that because remember I said a string is good, but it's not le going to let you change values. So when we're saying change the value of stats this or stats that and set it to, um, to this or that quantity, we're actually overriding the string because the string isn't a structure called stats. So it's going to make a structure called stats to do all that. So now we have to go to JSON. And we're going to see one that says um, convert JSON to a string variable. And our JSON string we just stored into stats. And where we want to store it is called stats. In fact, I don't know why I put double quotes on that. We should be pulling up our variable. And that's going to be our scene variable that's not a number. So we need the variable string stats. Okay, so now when we can when we read it from storage and store it as a string into stats, instead of overriding it later because it's a string and we're later telling it to um write things into a structure of stats, not a string of stats. Now we're making the string 
into stats and then we're converting that string and unpacking it right back into stats. So now it should show up like a structured variable when we look at the debugger. So now when we open the debugger and we look at our scene variables, we see our stats from storage. And instead of overriding it, when we try to um, call the variable the child crops and give it some values, it was overriding our string. But now since we had turned it into a structure, instead of overriding it, it just um, pulled those values that it was trying to find and put them right into our stats variable. So now you can see we have all our land is stored in here and we did not plant anything on our land when this was saved. So the only values we have in here so far is the X and Y. So now let's go, now that we're pulling it, um, our stats variable from storage, we're reading it from storage storing it into our stats scene variable as a big long string and then we're turning around and unpacking that string right back into the stats variable and turning it into a structure now we're going to have to put our land back in place and we're going to have to use our variable um our child variable land in that stats to do it so let's just hit shift a and we're going to make a new event now <clears throat> we can't really keep that event um, the way I'm about to do it, we can't keep it as a sub event to this stats existing in storage because it doesn't seem to parse and convert into the object variable um, if you do that. So we need to pull it out as a standalone event. So that means these things are only going to happen in your beginning scene events if that even exists in storage. But this thing that we're about to do is going to happen even if that doesn't exist in storage. Which will not mess the game up because if it doesn't exist in storage, it's just going to return that it doesn't exist in storage and it's not going to do anything. But we're just going to set it up to where it's going to check if the variable land even exists in stats before it does any of those. That way... Even though it should be executed as a part of a beginning scene event, it won't do that unless there's a child um, variable land in stats. And that basically means at this beginning of scene event that we did have a save. Because normally we don't have a child name land in our stats variable of our um, scene variable. Okay? So we'll just put child existence like we did in those other events earlier. And this time it's going to be of a scene variable. And our variable is called stats. And the child we want to look for is land. Because that will kind of narrow this down for us. Land does not exist in our um, scene variable stats unless we had a save event. Because that's not something we have in, natively in our scene variable. Okay, and let me just open this back up so you can see it. I was just illustrating that this is a separate event. And even though, you know, it would be nice to pull it under there, it works like this too. We're just checking to see if that that exists. And if it does, we're going to um, redo this part under it. And if not, it won't do that part. So we don't need to worry about it. So what we're going to do, we are going to need to go into that land and get all those structures that land has. Because remember, it's a big long string in our land variable. in our scene variable stats land it's just strings right now so we need to turn all these strings into a structure so that we can use it so that's the first thing we're going to do we will say um, we're going to set up a repeat event just one second though okay so we're going to set up a repeat event and we're going to um, hit shift w just to find an event that says for every child, for each child of a structure or an array. 
And this is the event we're going to want here. If we have a child called land in our scene variable stats, for every child in our variable stats dot land, we want to do something. We're going to store the child, which is our string. So let's go ahead and name that string just so you can remember it. We're going to store the child in variable string and the child name and we'll name this number because land, um, our variable land in stats is an array. So each child is actually named a number like zero or one, two, three. And the string is the value that we stored in those array numbers. So it'll be the X and Y position or any, any other information that we had in our variable stats of each piece of land. Okay, so for every child in stats land, we're going to store that child in our string variable and the child name and number, and we're going to do, so let's make this a sub-event to that so that it will be part of this, because right here it's not part of this and it won't do that. So now what we want to do for each child, if you remember, it's in a string, and we're, we can't use it like a string. We just store it like a string. So first we need to unpack that string so we can use it. So let's go ahead and put JSO in, and we are going to convert JSON to a scene variable. Okay. And our JSON string is stored in this variable we just created in our for each child event, variable string, and we named that variable string because it was a string variable okay and i was just trying to help you remember what it was and we're going to store this variable into a new scene variable and we're going to call this variable structure okay so let's look at what we did we said for each child and land take that string and land and we're going to store it in string and now take that variable string which means, you know, a string variable that's called string and convert it, unpack it into a new variable called structure. So structure will be our unpacked version of this string that's now a structured variable instead of a JSON. And string will be our unpacked version This um, still a JSON. So now we're going to create an object land. So land, and we're going to put create an object. And these are the, okay, we know we're going to place it on the base layer. So let's hit that. Now what's our X position and our Y position? All the information of land was stored into um, our variable stats, which is now in string. It was stored as a long string. So it had something called X in it, it has something called Y in it, so that's where our X and Y is going to be. So we need to go to where we unpacked that string into a structure, and that's going to have our X and Y position for our land. Okay, so JSON we can't use, we can't access it, even though the X and Y is in there, it's part of that string. We need to unpack that string into structure where we can access it to create our land at the X and Y position. And we had named those positions X and Y, those little variables that stored our X and Y position. So let's create the land at the X position will be variable and it's a scene variable structure. And the, um, the variable structure has a child named X because the string has different values, so the structure has the, the values set out for us. It's a little structure with children here. And we're going to put the Y position will be in a child of structure named Y. And that's the name we gave it when we set it up in land in our save events. We said to create a variable X and Y in the variable stats that we saved. Oh, this needs to be scene variable. V-A-R. Scene variable structure dot Y. Mm -hmm. 
So now we unpack. We put our string into string. We unpack string into structure. And in structure, we already know there's going to be a child called X and Y. Because we made a child called X and Y that we saved. Okay. So let's go ahead and run our preview. And now we can see the land is where we had saved it. So, so much for that. So now we have one more thing to do um, to get land back to where it was. So land already is at its right place now because we needed to create it before this next event. Because in the next event, we're going to put the variables that land had in it right back into land. So whatever variables land had at save time, we're going to put them right back into land. And in this instance, it only had the X and Y because we hadn't actually planted anything. So let's go ahead and add a new action. And we want to look for JSON once again. And we're going to say convert JSON to an object variable. Okay. And our JSON string, where did we store that? We said for each child of the variable stats land, which is all our JSON strings, put that child into a variable named string. So our JSON string, untouched and unmade into a structure, is still in that variable called string. So let's, let's look for variable string, scene variable, and we'll call our ver we'll um, open up our variable string. So that's where our JSON string is stored. Because even though we we unpacked that into a new one called structure, we didn't tell it to get rid of the one called string. That's why I did it that way. I could have very well unpacked it from string and put it as a structure right back into string, and then just use string to do all these events. But I needed that string. Um, as a JSON still so that when I created my land I can convert that and unpack that JSON into a land structured variable so that's the whole reason I made another variable called um, structure otherwise knowing me I would have just took it out of string and put it right back into string as a structure so <laughs> Now we're going to choose our object and we're going to put the variable of our object's name. And we called that stats. That's the, the name we gave to store all our main things. So let's look at what we did one more time. We're reading stats from our storage and we're converting it back into a structure. It's JSON right now and we're putting it into a structure. But in this structure, we had stored JSON strings. So we need to convert those so that we can use them. So to convert those, we're going to take every child in land, which are the ones we stored, all those little JSON strings, and we're going to store for every child, we're going to take one JSON string out of that child and put it in this variable called string. And then we're going to use that string variable and convert it into a variable called structure, which is now a structured array. And from that structure, because we can access the values of structure, which we can't access them in string, we're going to look for the variable called structure.x and structure.y. And that's where we recreate our land, because that's the last positions of our land. And then we're going to turn around and go back to string, which is where our JSON for that piece of land is stored. And we're going to convert that JSON and store it into a variable of of our land called stats as a structure. So let's go ahead and run our logic. And now when we close the game, we're going to come back and it's going to be growing the crops that we put in there. And that's because of the logic we set up for our game. We set it up, um, if you worked through the project with me in the first tutorial, you know how we set it up to be kind of independent of anything. Um, all it needs is that variable in it, and then we tell it what to do. We tell it, if your animation is this, do that. If your cycle is this, do that. Well, it's got all that information stored. 
So in our beginning of scene events, it's just that simple. The only thing we have to do is get that variable stats back into that land and the game logic takes care of what animation to put it on. It takes care of how much more time it has to grow. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to um, parse the string, set it to stats of land, uh, set the animation of land to this, uh, you know, any of that. It's just that easy. The The tricky part is if you, if you can't really get what I'm saying right here, that's why I went over it a couple times. Because that's the only really tricky part. And, and if you can't, you know, it took me a while to get it too. So just keep trying, keep watching, and you'll see, I mean, it's just that easy. You, well, I'm not going to go over it again. Let me pause because I need to light a cigarette. So anyway, once we get, um, once we get our JSON strings out of where we had stored them in our scene variable stats, and we parse it so that we can get the variable X and Y where we can create the land. Because we can't really store the variable into land until we create it. So once we do that, and then we take our string and put it into our stats of land, the game takes care of the rest of the logic. It knows where something was planted, because um, it's all stored in our stats variable. And so that's the reason for this example that I made all the values be in one variable and that would be the variable that we would be storing because it does make um, your beginning scene events a lot easier especially if you set up your game logic the way we did that it's independent of of needing extra setup here basically once we create the land in the position it's supposed to be in and put that variable in the game takes care of the rest the game knows if something should be dead or something should be harvested or something was just planted what was planted where um see it already knew that we were gone so long that wheat should have been dead so now that we have our first set of save and load events i mean that's our only set of load events that's the only one we need but we still don't have a save event tied to our land so i can move my land around and if i come back it's, it's going to be back over here because I didn't set up anything to save yet unless I drop this or one of these items. And then if I come back, the land's going to be there because after I moved it, I had set up that. So now we're going to have to make a quick menu. I mean, there's other ways we can do it. It's just I chose to do this with the menu because... I feel it's less um, resource intensive than some of the other methods. So we're just gonna go into oh wrong button. I'm tired. It's getting late at night. Um, let's see. We're gonna add a new sprite, and we're gonna call this edit button. And we're just going to add an animation. And I put this in my tutorial farm folder. And I'll have to re-add them to the assets that I have over on itch.io. So let's go ahead and select our edit button. And we're going to hit OK. And we're going to apply that. And we'll just drag it out onto the scene. And we're going to go ahead and change the layer. It's on base layer now. Of course, we want it on the UI layer. And then we're going to go in here. And as you can see, I also went ahead and we added the animation number one, which was our OK button. Sorry, I had to quickly go see how I wanted to do that. I didn't know if I wanted separate objects. Or if I just wanted them the same but I decided it would be quicker to do it just keeping it the same object and then we're also going to need an animation number two and for that we're going to use the same animation as our first um, animation number zero so let's go ahead and apply those changes and then we're going to go ahead and set up the logic for the menu real quick 
but just add a new event and we'll shift W to make an event group. And we're just going to say, um, this will be, I'm not sure what I'll call this event group. I guess button logic maybe. But we'll say if the um, mouse was just released. So, mouse button released, our left mouse button. And now let's make a sub of it to that. And we'll say the cursor or touch <coughs> is on an object. And the object is going to be our edit button. Then what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to change the animation of our edit button. So edit button, change the animation, and we're going to add one. Okay, and so then what we're going to do is we are going to say um, under here, not a sub event to that, but a separate event. We're going to say edit button animation, current animation is equal to two. Then let's copy this change the number of animation, add one, and we'll say change the number of uh, animation of ed edit button and we're going to set that to zero. So what's going to happen is we are going to touch the, the button the first time. It's going to go to our OK. So then we'll be able to drag crops around. we got to set that log logic up though. And then when we touch the OK button it's going to go back to um, number two and since it's number two it's going to go back to zero which looks exactly like number two okay so now let's see I guess we'll call that um, edit button logic that'll be good okay so the next thing we're gonna have to do is tell our land it can't be dragged unless um, unless we're in the edit menu. So let's go ahead and go to our land placement. Um, I guess I'll call it end draggable behavior and land placement and behavior. Okay, and so let's just select this and hit shift A to make a new event group. And we're gonna say um, if the Boolean variable Let's, let's do a scene variable of this. And we'll call this variable, um, let's see, if, if the, let's see, actually maybe we should just try the animation first because we already have an animation set up. So before we do it that way, we might still have to do it that way. Let's see if we can just um, make some animation rules. So in this one we can say, um, Edit button, animation number, current animation is equal to one, which would be, that's our okay animation. That means we opened the edit menu. Then we'll activate the draggable behavior of land. So let's say land, B-E-H, and we'll activate the behavior draggable of land, yes. Okay, so that means when it's not one, I mean it's not two. No, that's one. So that means when it's not one, we don't want it to be um, draggable. So let's go ahead and add another one. We'll just copy that, paste it, and if it's zero, because that's gonna be the default. So if we put it at zero, um, that means we don't have to go up into our beginning scene events and deactivate the behavior because by default the animation will be zero. So that's why we're adding it there. Otherwise we could just add it here because we know that once we um, close the edit button, it's gonna go to two. So we could have put deactivate the behavior there, but then we would have to go up to our beginning scene events 
and add like a deactivate um, behavior at the beginning of scene and why do an extra thing if we don't have to so we're just going to add one that says um, change the number of animation or the number of animation is zero and we're going to copy this right here paste it here and we're going to say activate the draggable behavior of land no okay so now we actually need to see if that works oh um, let's see okay so as you can see i'm trying to drag my land around and it's not working but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work okay it does work look and now i can move my little land around again okay now let me click this and once again my land is frozen so that's perfect we set up just a really quick simple um land editing menu and now most importantly we can use that menu to trigger our save events because if you recall, we also needed save events for our land. <laughs> okay, and the best place to put our save events for our land is going to be right here when our animation changes to 2. Because we don't want to put it here. This is the default. So like, um, and it sits at default most of the time. But if you remember, here, it is briefly at 2 right before we change it to 0. So this is a perfect place to do a save of it. Because that way, instead of saving like every frame, it's only saving quickly right before it changes the edit button, the animation back to 0. So let's go ahead and add our save event there. So let's go copy and paste that save event because it's getting late. And I'm pretty ready to be done with this tutorial. So we have that in our menu items placement. So real quick, I'm going to go over here and we're going to make a um, external event. And we're going to call this event save events. Okay, and we're just going to choose the scene that we want, and that's our untitled scene. Oh, I can't believe I left that untitled. That's just not like me. We should change that someday. Um, let's change it now. I'm going to change it to main farm. Okay, so now we got that done. Let's open that back up. And we'll open up our external um, event, our save event. We got to put it on main farm now because I changed the name. All right, so now let's go back into our farm events and let's look at the ones we want. And we want to copy our save events so that we can also use them on our save button. And we'll just save a couple extra steps. So fold this up because when you're copying... Um, multiple events you're going to hold the shift key and you don't need to hold shift here shift here and then hold shift here too because that's going to duplicate it all twice now so let me undo that real quick um if it will let me oh there it goes <laughs> scared me for a minute so we're just going to fold that up so we don't accidentally click it so hold shift click that click that and i believe that was all of our save events so let's go ahead and copy this real quick okay and i hope that was all our save events i feel like um i feel like save events aren't that hard because that's all there is of them okay so let's go to our um external event we're gonna shift a just to get an event up so we can paste that there and so now you see we have our save events just the way we had them um, in that first line so we're gonna go ahead and go back to our main event back to where it says the animation of button is to we're gonna add an event here let me get some oh why am I adding them all up there that makes no sense let me select them all trying to move them down so you can see what I'm doing better all right move you all down here 
Did I only take one of them? Oh my god. Okay, scratch that idea. We're just gonna delete those. And we're gonna come down here and highlight that and then make a bunch more. Alright, that's better. Alright, now we can see again. Okay, so we're gonna come down there where we added our sub event to this. And this is where we want our save events to sit. So, um, we got to go to, let me see if it's on shift W. Now we're going to link an external event. And this event we want as a sub event to our, um, number animation of edit button equals two. And the name of this external event we're linking is save event. And in it, it's exactly our save event. We wipe our array just in case it already has land stored in there. So we won't keep making more values on our land. Then we change all our land values and we append them to the array in our, our main scene variable. And then we write that whole scene variable, which has everything. It's got our quantity and our, cro you know, it's got everything in it. We write that to our storage. So that's our save of it and we're putting it there. And so we might as well come up here where our first one was and we might as well go ahead and delete these. And we'll just go ahead and <clears throat> hit shift W and we'll add a link another external event. And we'll move it under the was just dropped just like the other one was. And it'll be our save of it. And we do want it in the same position that that other one was. Which was one indented from it. Okay, so now when we, when the number animation goes to that, we could probably leave that here. I'm going to move it down just so I can make sure it's going to be the last action that happens. That first it will do the save events and then it will come and do that. So let's go see what happens. Let's see if we can save a position of land without having to drag a crop around. Because right now, remember, before we did that, our only save events were tied to dropping our crops. So we'll just go ahead and close out of there and we'll close out of the game. And then we're going to come back and see if it saved it. Okay, so now we have our save events tied two different places. Once, if we're planting crops, because we need to save that information, and the person might not necessarily do anything with that button, um, so we can't just tie the save events to this button. And then the next one we have is for moving our objects around, because again, the player might come in their farm and just decide to move things around without ever dragging a crop, so then that wouldn't trigger our drop um, our drop save event here. So that's why we needed them in two different places. Okay, so it looks like it's working as we expected. And I'm just going to pause this so I can make sure I remember to tell you everything I wanted and to even think if we're done with this. Because I've been doing this for like, I don't know, an hour two hours now and I'm super tired and I don't remember if we did everything we're supposed to so hold on let me just regroup my thoughts and collect myself okay so I did write down a few things I want to go over and one is these last events we put on and just being dragged that's fine hopefully these are the only ones um we can get rid of this we can change this back to um, land placement. Alright, um, right here, if the number is zero, we want to deactivate the behavior no. But it's going to keep doing that every frame. So you could just do a quick trigger once here. And that way, it'll trigger that once. Or you could do like a, um, like I like to do, play a little game of like, what can we do instead of a trigger once. Um, we could do like a, if the behavior isn't already deactivated, then 
if it's zero and the behavior is activated, then deactivate it. So we could do that too. I'm just doing a trigger once now because I kind of um, feel like y'all should be doing your best behavior in your um, programming. So actually right here, we don't want to trigger that once. I don't know why I put that one there. This doesn't need to be triggered once. And I never add trigger once as if it doesn't need to be. Um, because it's it's saying if it's two, do this, and then switch to zero. So once it switches to zero, it's no longer two. So it's completely unnecessary to add a trigger once there. The only reason we need to add trigger once here is because... Um, Let's see if that even works as I intended. Yeah, it's because um, if it's one, we can trigger once the draggable behavior and that's all we need to do. And we don't need to keep setting the behavior to draggable. And we don't need to keep setting this behavior to non-draggable. So that was one point I wrote down. Um, let me see. Okay, the next point. Um, I did want it to set it up like if we were in our OK menu, we wouldn't be able to drag these kind of items around and plant crops and stuff when we're in the middle of editing. Okay, so that was another point that I wanted to go over. So really quickly, let's find that and see how to fix that. So let's see our menu placement items. Activate behavior oh draggable. We'll say we'll make these both a sub event. And the condition will have to be if the um the animation is not on number one. Because on number one animation, that's when it's saying okay, that means we're in our level editing menu. So if we're in our level editing menu we don't want to activate the behavior draggable of our menu icons. We want to deactivate them. Let me see if that would work though because by default they're activated when the game starts. So that might not even work. Ugh. I might have to just create a new Might just have to create a new event. <clears throat> Let me try it that way. And if that doesn't work, we'll think of something else. Because it's getting late, but I really want to finish this before I go to bed. Because um, I don't want to get all this way into it and then pause it and then, you know, go to work in the morning and come home and there was a power outage and I, it's all lost. So, let's see. Um, I guess we can also... When it's here, when the draggable land, we'll try that. We'll copy this and we'll paste it and we'll change this object to our menu icons. And we'll say activate the draggable behavior no. Because if we're dragging, if we're able to drag the land, we don't want to be able to drag the menu icon. So hopefully that'll work. Um, let's see. And here we'll do the same thing. We'll paste that and we'll say activate the draggable behavior of menu icons, yes. Um, so hopefully that works because I'm getting really tired. So let me see, we can drag them. And with this open, tell me we can't drag them. Oh, we can't drag them, that's beautiful. And so now let's close it and we can drag them. I'm so glad, it might seem like simple logic to you, but, <laughs> but I'm really tired so I might not be thinking straight right now. So that takes care of that. Now when our um, when our menu is open and we're able to drag these objects around, we're not able to go and plant crops. And that brings me to another point I had written down. Let me find it here. Crop overlap. The way this game is set up right now, when you drag the um, land around, you can actually overlap other land. And that is a subject for a whole complete tutorial on its own so I just did want to remember to mention that I am aware of this I'm just not covering it 
in this tutorial on purpose because um, that is something that will require a bit of setup and I can probably do that in my next tutorial because you've got to tell GDevelop if something's in collision with itself but it can't tell when things are in collision with themselves. So we're just gonna not brush that topic in this part of the tutorial, but I can expand this tutorial and just make like a, um, a third part of the series where I go over how we can set it up to where the land cannot overlap the land. So that was another thing I wanted to mention. So let me see, was that it? Global variables. Okay, so we have set this all up in our in our load events that we're loading it directly into scene variables because we only have one scene in this game. So all we have is scene variables. Now you may have global variables in your game and your main variable that's the equivalent to my variable stats might be a global variable, not a scene variable. So the, to load the game, it's the exact same setup. The only difference being that we can't um, we can't load things directly into a global variable. So you would do this part the same. You would read stats from storage uh, of your storage and store it into your scene variable, which could be a temporary variable that you just made for this event. And then you would turn and instead of converting the JSON into another scene variable, that's where you would convert that into your main variable that was actually a global variable. So that's how you would handle global variables. The same way, it's just one little extra line, um, and not even really an extra line for us because we were doing this extra line of conversion anyway. It's only an extra line if you're just reading like, read the number five from this storage and store it into the scene variable and then store that scene variable number five into our global variable. That's the only time it's an extra step. The way we're doing it where we're loading it into a variable and then we have to unpack it into a variable, it's really not an extra step. We would just load it right into our scene variable, a temporary scene variable as we're doing here, and then we would unpack it into our global variable. So I think those are the only points that I went over. Um, I'll double check this logic that we added tomorrow and then I'll upload this example onto my itch.io. Uh, I just want to make sure I didn't overlook any other glaring errors like not putting a trigger once on these um, animation button things um, so that they keep activating behavior that's already been activated in the previous frame. So if, I'm just going to double check it real quick for any other glaring errors I might have made while we were setting up our our events. Hopefully there's not much. I don't feel like we set up too many events here. So that is pretty much it for our um, tutorial, our first and second part of the tutorial. And like I said, I'll probably do a third part now just to go over how we can get rid of these overlapping, um, oh yeah, over these overlapping objects there. So I hope you enjoyed it and have a good night.